Good evening. Welcome to the 2022 Kluge Prize Award Ceremony. We will begin with a video about the prize recipient. Hi, I'm George Chauncey, and I'm a professor of 20th century American history at Columbia University. Much of my research, writing, and even teaching for the last 40 years has been concerned with the history of LGBTQ people in the 20th century. George has a unique ability to place LGBTQ history at the very center of American history. He has used what he has learned to change the law to change the way we think about things, to change the way we think about the past. Um, Chauncey's work gives us um, that story that we need to tell um, about ourselves so that we can be our better selves. Dr. Chauncey's work over the decades has helped the nation move closer to its ideals and away from its discriminations. The petitioners are entitled to respect for their private lives. The state cannot demean their existence or control their destiny by making their private sexual conduct a crime. Their right to liberty under the Due Process Clause gives them the full right to engage in their conduct without intervention of the government. It is the promise of the Constitution that there is a realm of personal liberty which the government may not enter. My father was a Presbyterian minister who was involved in the Civil Rights Movement and shall we say, was asked to leave a couple of churches along the way. Uh, so I lived in Tennessee, Arkansas, Georgia, Kentucky, and Virginia. The minute I saw George, it was immediate. I, I realized I was in love. <laughs> Within a few weeks, he moved in with me in Chicago, and that was 20 years ago. If I merely had just masculine desires, or if I only had the earnings of a fan, one of the most unexpected findings of my research for many people, including myself, was that there was a really vibrant, extensive, and often quite visible gay world in American cities, certainly in New York, in the early 20th century. Because I just went gay all of a sudden. My name is Jason Holliday. <laughs> My name is Aaron Payne. His book, Gay New York, came out in 1994, my first year teaching. And I thought that was one of the most exciting ways of doing legal history that I'd ever seen. He brought gender and sexuality into the story. By the time that George arrived at Columbia, it had been very clear for two decades that he was one of the finest historians of his generation. This is a history that's really unexpected, and I think it's important for people to realize that LGBTQ history is not just a history of policing, isolation, shame, and despair. There's also an enormous amount of resistance to that policing, and also many people who found ways to find joy and build a rich social life. Um, you simply can't underestimate the significance of the court um, ruling that gay couples, gay married couples, should be treated the same as heterosexual married couples. So I've testified in court, been deposed, submitted affidavits and amicus briefs in cases including Lawrence v. Texas, which overturned the nation's remaining sodomy laws, Windsor, which invalidated the Defense of Marriage Act, and Obergefell, which established the right of gay couples to marry nationwide. The decision whether and whom to marry is among life's momentous acts of self-definition. This is true for all persons, whatever their sexual orientation. The court now holds that same-sex couples may exercise the fundamental right to marry in all states. No longer may this liberty be denied to them. The Kluge Chair is an extraordinary opportunity. We're looking forward to working with Dr. Chauncey on a series of public programs drawing on his research. The overall theme will be through history to equality. His students 
and the students that come after them have his model for how to be an American, how to be a citizen. And it is not by leaning back and basking in the fantasy that we've figured it all out. Instead, it's about rolling up your sleeves and doing the work that's in front of you. Everyone, please welcome the director of the Kluge Center, Kevin Butterfield. Good evening. Dr. Hayden, members of Congress, representatives from the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Madison Council, members of our Scholars Council, Kluge Center scholars and alumni, and our many other distinguished guests. Welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Building at the Library of Congress for the conferral of the John W. Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity. All of us at the Library of Congress are honored that you have joined us here to recognize the work of a truly distinguished scholar and a great educator. I'd also like to welcome those of you joining us virtually or watching a recording of this event. The John W. Kluge Prize honors work of the highest quality and greatest influence, work that advances our understanding of the human experience. Its potential recipients can come from a wide range of scholarly fields and disciplines, including nearly all of the humanities and social sciences. The library's mission is to engage, inspire, and inform Congress and the American people with a universal and enduring source of knowledge and creativity. The Kluge Prize embodies that mission. Selection is based on three factors. Deep intellectual achievement in the study of humanity. The creation of scholarship that has had influence on public affairs and civil society. And third, it is intended for scholars who possess that rare ability to communicate the meaning, the significance, the transformative potential of their work to people across the nation and around the world. And the Kluge Prize is not earned in a day. As of this evening, it will have been awarded to 13 world-class scholars who over a sustained period throughout their careers have distilled wisdom from the cumulative record of human experience and have thereby shaped public life. The library solicits nominations from thousands of national and international institutions and esteemed individuals. The librarian makes a final decision, drawing from a rigorous selection process involving curators, librarians, and specialists from our staff as well as a distinguished panel of some of the world's leading scholars. The late John W. Kluge made an extraordinary impact here, here at America's oldest federal cultural institution. We are deep, deeply grateful for his generosity in creating the endowment that funds this prize and that funds the research of the many scholars who spend time in residence at the Kluge Center here in the Jefferson Building. Over the past two decades, the center has welcomed more than 1,000 scholars from around the world to build relationships, study in our vast collections, and interact with policymakers and the public. More than 40 current and former scholars are here with us tonight. The American founding generation knew, as George Washington said in his first inaugural, that knowledge is in every country the surest foundation of public happiness. Within the Jefferson Building, an institutional symbol of the importance of knowledge to our democracy, adjacent to the US Capitol, we thank the members of Congress uh, for creating the Library of Congress and for sustaining it for more than two centuries. Our collections originated in the earliest days of the Republic and were rebuilt in the 19th century with the acquisition of Thomas Jefferson's personal library. Since then, the library has grown to include more than 173 million items. And over that time, the United States Congress has been the greatest patron of a library in the history of the world. We thank the distinguished members who are in the audience with us tonight. I would like, too, to thank the two most recent directors of the Kluge Center who did so much to make this evening the celebration of the pursuit of knowledge possible. I want to thank John Haskell for his leadership over five years, a man who not only helped lead the center through the pandemic shutdown, but also throughout his tenure worked to expand the scholarly, public, and congressional programs here at the center. We wish John the best in his retirement. 
And I'd like to thank Brent Iacobucci for his leadership as acting director of the Kluge Center for much of 2022. In that time, he had a profound and positive impact on the center, our staff, and scholars. He was an excellent director in a time of change, and I know the Congressional Research Service is thrilled to have his abilities with them once again. But now, it is my great pleasure to invite the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, to confer the 2022 Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity. Thank you, Kevin. And we are honored to have you as the new director of the Kluge Center. Scholars, colleagues, friends, distinguished guests, I too am so pleased to have you here with us this evening. And for many of you, welcome to the Library of Congress. My predecessor, the 13th Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington, had the vision to create this prize as well as the Kluge Center and worked alongside John W. Kluge to turn his vision into reality. Scholars of tremendous stature whose work and career had a profound effect on civil society across the globe, John Hope Franklin, Fernando Henrique Cardoza, and most recently, Drew Gilpin, Phil Faust, and Daniel Allen have received this honor. And tonight, it is my great privilege to confer the Cluey Prize on and to be our laureate, Dr. George Clancy. He is the DeWitt Clinton Professor of American History at Columbia University. He directs the Columbia Research Institute on the Global History of Sexualities. With pride tonight, it is my honor to say that Dr. Chauncey is the first scholar, the first scholar, not the last, in LGBTQ plus studies to receive the Kluge Prize. <laughs> 2018 Kluge Prize winner, Drew Gilpin Faust said this about Dr. Chauncey. He has entirely revised our understanding of LGBTQ history in the United States and in doing so has established it as one of the most vibrant fields of current historical inquiry. His trailblazing career gave all of us better insight into and understanding of the LGBTQ plus community and its history. His work helped transform our nation's attitudes and laws and epitomizes the Kluge Center's mission to support research at the intersection of the humanities and public policy. Since 1993, he has participated as a historian in more than 30 court cases, including four that reached the US Supreme Court. And as you saw in the earlier video, it includes such landmark Supreme Court cases as Romer versus Evans, Lawrence versus Texas, and the marriage equality cases United States versus Windsor and Ober And I make sure I have to say this correctly, Obergefeld and Hodges. And as Dr. Gordon said in the video, his work has helped change the law and helped change the way we think about the past. The Library of Congress's mission is to connect and engage with all Americans. And that means telling the rich, diverse stories of all citizens of this country. It also is the library's responsibility as the nation's library to preserve and share our collective history. Dr. Chauncey has proven his entire career that LGBTQ plus history is American history. And we are here tonight to celebrate his work. And so, he is nothing short of a model for historians and scholars in all fields, exemplified by doing deep research 
with the connection to challenges facing democracies. And I might add emphatically the courage to engage fully with policymakers, opinion leaders, and the public. In his nomination to receive the prize, a sentence sums him up perfectly. Dr. Chauncey has helped this country take a step closer to what it means to be fully democratic. I couldn't agree more. So Dr. Chauncey, will you please come forward to receive the 2022 Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity. I'm never going to win an Olympic medal, but this, this, <laughs> this will do. <laughs> Thank you. So I'd like to begin by thanking Dr. Hayden, both for choosing me for this prize and for her stewardship of this magnificent institution, and by thanking many other people, too many to name, including the dear souls on that video who said such extravagant things about me. Thank you my friends and family, and above all my parents, who I wish were still with us to share this moment, the members of the Advisory Selection Committee, my academic colleagues, mentors and students, and the librarians and staff I've been working with here at the Library of Congress for whom I've developed enormous respect. In fact, I wanna thank all librarians and archivists whom I, like every scholar, have relied on to conduct my research and otherwise do my work and whom children and young people across the country rely on to open new doors to new worlds and new ways of thinking about the world they inhabit. We are all in their debt for the crucial work they do for our communities and our nation. The one other person I'd like to thank by name is my husband, Ron Gregg, whose love and support has sustained me these last 28 years and without whom I could barely imagine my life. I gratefully accept this prize, not just for myself, but on behalf of a field of study and a group of courageous scholars whose work on the LGBTQ past was marginalized for far too long. To have the Library of Congress recognize the scholarly quality and significance of this field is profoundly important. It's also especially meaningful to receive an award for achievement in the study of humanity, since the very humanity of the people I study was for so long denied. Forty years ago, when I began graduate school, the field of lesbian gay history, as it was called then, barely existed and had no standing in the discipline of history. It's hard to convey today just how little we knew about the LGBTQ past, or to convey the climate of fear that discouraged research into that history. I was blessed to have mentors who were supportive of such work and had my best interests at heart, but even they warned me that writing a dissertation on gay history might amount to professional suicide. And it almost did. In my three years in the job market before I was hired by the good folks at the University of Chicago in 1991, I occasionally encountered the personal disdain towards gay people that we usually call homophobia, but more often I encountered the conviction that inquiry into the history of LGBTQ people was too narrow a topic or too marginal to his American history, even though this clearly was the result of such inquiry having been systematically blocked, devalued, and marginalized by the dis discipline. And even though, as subsequent scholarship has shown, queer history has the capacity to make us rethink so much of what we thought we knew about American history. It was only because of historians of women, African Americans, and ordinary working people had begun expanding the terrain of historical inquiry in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s that I was able to undertake my research. I relied on their work for many of the methodological and conceptual tools I used 
as well as inspiration. And the practical support of such historians was crucial to my career. In the end, I've had a very fortunate academic career. But I cannot say emphatically enough how close my career came to ending before it even began. Given the marginalization of LGBTQ history in the early 1990s, and the fact that I almost didn't get a job, it came as a surprise to me in 1993 when lawyers from Land Legal and the ACLU asked me for the first time to testify in a court case about the history of anti-gay discrimination. The case challenged the constitutionality of a recently enacted Colorado State Constitutional Amendment that prohibited any level or agency of the government from protecting LGBTQ people from discrimination. I flew to Denver to testify at that trial after weeks of preparation. That case ultimately resulted in the Supreme Court's 1996 ruling in Romer v. Evans that this amendment violated the Federal Constitution's Equal Protection Clause. Little did I know this case would open up a new chapter in my career. Over the following years, as you heard me say on the video, I was asked to testify, submit affidavits or declarations, prepare amicus briefs, be deposed or otherwise participate as an expert witness in more than 30 LGBTQ rights cases. It was a revelation to learn that historical scholarship could inform the deliberations of the courts as they grappled with profound questions concerning the reach of the Constitution's guarantees of liberty, equal protection, and due process, thereby charting the extent of our basic rights as citizens, including the right to sexual intimacy itself and to marry the person we love. I had no idea. At the risk of being schematic, I thought it might be appropriate to say a little about the three broad historical issues my testimony usually focused on. One task, and I think the broadest and most complex one, was to describe the history of sexual regulation across the sweep of American history. In the historian's amicus brief, I organized and served as lead author on in Lawrence v. Texas, which the Supreme Court heard in 2003. The brief sought to persuade the court that the historical rationale about the ancient pedigree of anti-homosexual laws and teaching, which it had used to help sustain the constitutionality of sodomy laws in its 1986 decision in Bowers v. Hardwick, was incorrect. We provided the court with an alternative interpretation of the history of sexual categories and sexual regulation, which showed that the very object of regulation and implicitly the very sexual categories we use to understand ourselves had changed over the centuries. We showed that historically, the colonial categories of sodomy and buggery were not the same as the modern category of homosexuality because they typically referred to a wider range of non-sexual, non-procreative sexual activities a man might engage in with a man, a woman, or a beast and at the same time did not penalize or even recognize what today we would call homosexual conduct between women. We argued there was a decisive shift in the 20th century from the regulation of sexual behavior to a new legal regime put in place primarily in the mid 20th century in which for the first time the state classified certain of its citizens as homosexuals and discriminated against them on the basis of their homosexual status or identity. In retrospect, I've always appreciated the challenge of crafting a concise analytic narrative of the full sweep of American sexual regulation because I had never before noticed or grasped the enormity and significance of this shift. We then noted that the law under review in Lawrence had been enacted by the state of Texas in the 1970s to single out homosexual conduct for criminalization at the very moment that it decriminalized the non-procreative acts of heterosexual that of heterosexual couples that its historic sodomy law had penalized. We continued that the law should therefore be seen as a product of the new regime of anti-gay discrimination that developed in the 20th century, rather than the product of millennia of anti-homosexual teaching, as the Chief Justice had averred in his conferring opinion in Bowers. In its decision overturning the nation's remaining sodomy laws, the court cited the historian's brief and devoted a significant portion of its decision to questions of history. I've never been sure how much our brief contributed to the case's outcome, but clearly history mattered. 
and I was honored when the New York Times published part of our brief that Sunday under the headline, Educating the Court and Changing the Law of the Land, Six Justices Turn to Its History. The second purpose of my testimony and the most common purpose was to document the sweeping history of anti-gay discrimination in the nation's past, particularly under the 20th century regime I just described. Lawyers hope this historical record would support an equal protection claim that any new law discriminating against LGBTQ people should be subject to heightened scrutiny by the courts and thus require a higher level of justification because so many prior laws and regulations had singled them out for invidious discrimination. Here I drew on the research I'd done for Gay New York and other historians' work to chart the astonishing range of laws and regulations that sought to suppress gay life and render it invisible to outsiders, most of them enacted in the 1930s and 40s. State regulations that prohibited restaurants and bars from serving or employing homosexuals. Military regulations excluding gay people from service. Federal and municipal regulations prohibiting the employment of gay people as civil servants. Professional licensing rules that prohibited gay people from working as lawyers and doctors. Cabaret performers, not cab drivers. A Hollywood censorship code that for 30 years, at the height of Hollywood's influence, prohibited movies from including gay characters or even inferring the existence of what it called sexual perversion all of which discriminated against a class of people identified as homosexuals, conveyed the state's and society's hostility to them, sought to render homosexuality invisible and therefore the authorities clearly hoped less thinkable, and forced gay people to be even more careful to hide their lives, their partners, their friends. And all of which, except the military ban, had been almost entirely forgotten because their history has been so rarely documented and even more rarely taught. Faced with this historical record, some courts agree that laws singling out gay people for disparate treatment should receive heightened scrutiny or some level of intermediate scrutiny. Most did not, courts rarely do, but the gravity of this history nonetheless seemed to weigh on their deliberations. Or so at least the lawyers were kind enough to tell me, what do I know? <laughs> A third person, a purpose of my testimony as a historian was to chart the history of anti-gay demonization. This was especially important in the 2010 Prop 8 trial, ultimately named Hollingsworth v. Perry, which challenged the constitutionality of Proposition 8, a California voter referendum that had taken marriage rights away from gay couples in 2008. One goal of my trial testimony was to show how the messaging strategies used by the Prop 8 campaign, which made protect our children, its central slogan and animating argument, echoed the efforts of generations of anti-gay activists to depict homosexuals as threats to the nation's children. A series of press and police campaigns during the anti-gay crackdowns of the 1950s represented the first sustained effort to depict gay people as inveterate seducers and molesters of children, to quote them. This fearsome image was revived by Anita Bryant's campaign in 1977 to overturn Miami-Dade County's recently enacted gay rights ordinance, which she declared was a crusade to, quote, save our children from homosexual teachers who would be freed by a gay rights law, or according to her flyers and newspaper ads, to influence, seduce, and sexually assault the county's children. The successes of Bryant's Florida crusade meant such demonic images and claims became an enduring centerpiece of subsequent campaigns against LGBTQ rights and visibility across the country. Such claims saturated the anti-gay videos and literature circulated during scores of local referendum campaigns designed to overturn or forestall the passage of gay rights measures in the 1980s and 1990s including the 1992 Amendment 2 campaign in Colorado, which had been an issue in Romer. The Prop 8 campaign was more subtle in its depiction of why children needed to be protected from allowing gay adults to marry. It was California in 08, after all. But it could be 
because of the enduring legacy of earlier anti-gay campaigns. And it was deeply heartening to see the trial judge accept and exclaim this historical argument in his decision that Prop 8 was unconstitutional. Now, participating as a historian in these cases has been one of the most rewarding parts of my career and surely the most unexpected. In the end, though, I've always found more pleasure in writing books and essays longer than the 30 pages an amicus brief can be, and more subtle, complex, and, ex and expansive than courtroom testimony can be. And while I think it's crucial to recognize how anti-gay animus, laws, and regulations have permeated and shaped almost every aspect of queer existence, ultimately, I've been more interested in learning how people forged lives under these constraints and resisted them before a formal political movement existed. The demonization of homosexuals and the rules which sought to render LGBTQ people and life invisible often had devastating effects on the self-regard of people exploring their sense of gender and sexual difference. But to a remarkable degree, I found, their effectiveness depended on their success in keeping people isolated. Once people found other LGBTQ folks, they met people who modeled for them the possibilities of gay love and life, and often taught them how to survive and thrive in a hostile society. They learned how to find the places where other people like themselves gathered, from dinner parties and house parties, to illegal bars and restaurants that paid off the police, to dances in places ranging from private homes to urban ballrooms to isolated barns and farm country. They learned the, the codes people use to communicate safely and to keep their world hidden. They learned that rather than being condemned to lives of isolation and self-rebuke, it was possible for them to forge rich social lives and find friendship, love, joy, and respect. Among other things, their guides to gay life are likely to introduce them to a world of cultural resources some scholarly studies and medical treatises, to be sure, but far more often novels, plays, movies, and popular songs, which either directly explored LGBTQ life or could be read and heard in ways that offered more meaningful and affirming reflections on same-sex love and queer existence. In my next book, I write at length about those cultural resources and about the social worlds in which people learned about them and learned how to interpret them. But perhaps this is a good place to end by returning to where I began, by thanking the librarians who sometimes unknowingly and often quite deliberately made sure those resources were available in the darkest days to the people who needed them the most. Thank you. It has been our great honor to award George Chauncey the 2022 Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity. Tonight has given us a remarkable opportunity to survey the work he has done, the impact it has had on our world. It is so gratifying to me to see how a richer understanding of the past can improve our present and our future. His thoughtful remarks tonight are just a small part of what we have to learn from him. I'm sure you're all eager to learn more, so stay tuned to the Kluge Center's website as we announce upcoming public programming with Professor Chauncey to be released in 2023. This concludes the Kluge Prize ceremony. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. Congratulations, Dr. Chauncey. And we are grateful to everyone watching virtually and joining us here in person at the Library of Congress. Thank you. <laughs>